Good evening, everyone. On behalf of National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder, I'd like to welcome you to this free series of family education workshops that are open to the public. NEA BPD was founded 12 years ago by Dr. Perry Hoffman and others with the singular goal of reducing stigma, enhancing knowledge about this disorder, and ultimately building better lives for the millions of people affected by borderline personality disorder and their families. We do this through advocacy, both on a national basis and international basis, um, through conferences, through the creation of a class and the dissemination of this class called Family Connections. Family Connections is a 12-week manualized program for relatives of people who have borderline personality disorder. And the way that relatives sign up for this class is through the website neabpd.com. In the Families tab, you will find the registration place. Along with conferences and, um, and classes, we also engage in advocacy, and we do this on an international uh, basis. This workshop series offers fantastic monthly topics such as family involvement in the treatment of BPD, organ self-harm, suicide, and high-risk behaviors, and even towards the end of the series, a patient panel. So that should be really, really interesting. But for now, I'd like to introduce, and it's my great honor to introduce, one of the greatest names in this field, a staunch supporter of families and patients, and a great friend of, of NEABPD, as well as a fantastic speaker, Dr. John Gunderson. This talk, usually when uh, I do this once a year, and I almost always have given some overview talk about borderline personality disorder, about the evolution of the diagnosis and uh, its current status. The talk I'm gonna to give tonight is different. Uh, I've been working this summer on preparing a talk that was, is going to be given to people who are not in the mental health community. And uh, so I wanted, I first thought of the title for the talk would be an introduction to psychiatry and I was gonna talk about major changes in psychiatry which have occurred during, my, during the course of my career. I couldn't do that without getting into borderline personality disorder because my career is so inextricably tied with the development and evolution of this diagnosis. So what you'll hear tonight is part of this larger talk that I'm preparing and which one day I hope will get published outside of the uh, psychic mental health literature, maybe in, into the public literature. Um, but uh, a, it's going to feature the time when I first entered psychiatry, and there will be a patient named Lucille, who I'll describe, who first appeared when I was a resident. And uh, she's a prototype for borderline personality disorder. And then we'll return to uh, Lucille uh, 30 years later, the same patient, and uh, she'll receive a different sort of treatment in a different setting and I'll want to sort of contrast and comment about what's changed in the meantime. I'm going to focus on two major developments in psychiatry, which was standardized diagnosis, of which borderline personality disorder was one, and the uh, evolution of psychopharmacology medications. So this next, this first period, I've divided it up into three eras. And uh, I'm only going to talk about the first and the third. This is the first one. Psychoanalysis and hospital psychiatry are changed by diagnostic standards and psychopharmacology. In September of 1968, when I began my residency training, Lucille was brought to the emergency room by a young man who reported his life had been turned upside down by the anxieties posed by her recurrent suicidality. Lucille was a 23-year-old cheerleader pretty strawberry blonde who sought help for suicidal thoughts, severe anxiety, and depression. On evaluation, she reported a history of cutting herself starting in early adolescence, insomnia, brief paranoid episodes, and periods of dissociation, that is a feeling unreal, 
She blamed her problems on having had a dysfunctional and neglectful family. Lucille was hospitalized and I was assigned to be her psychiatrist. Impressed by her report of brief episodes of hearing voices and believing people are thinking she was evil, she was diagnosed with atypical schizophrenia. And I began to see her three times a week in psychotherapy. From the start, this assignment left me vacillating between the appeal of rescuing this pretty cheerleader and the frightening possibility of her killing herself on my watch. What followed was not the suicide I feared, but a treatment process that left me hoping I'd never see a patient like Lucille again. I alienated the nursing staff who said I was being manipulated, and unable to set limits. I alienated my supervisor who told me I had a serious countertransference blind spots that caused me to disregard the unconscious hostility that lay behind my patient's suicidal threats. I alienated my fellow residents who viewed my worries as self-pity. I even alienated Lucille's family for having accepted her vilification of them. And particularly, I alienated my wife who quickly tired of hearing about this patient and the insomnia she invoked. <laughs> This slide sort of summarizes what happened in 1968. Lucille was one of the reasons I entered psychotherapy. At that time, personal psychotherapy was widely considered a desired, if not essential part of one's training to become a psychiatrist. About two thirds of the uh, residents in my group entered into serious, sometimes uh, multiple times a week psychotherapy. At the University of Colorado, psychoanalyses four to five times a week were required of all residents and even paid for by the institution. Lucille was also the stimulus for the research I did during the next five years that defined this disorder. Now the background. Without reliable diagnoses, observable causes, and without scientifically validated treatment, psychiatry had always existed on the fringes of medicine. By 1968, its major advances had been describing the distinctive characteristics and course of schizophrenia, manic depressive disorder, as it was called then, now bipolar, and depression. Treatments included hospitalizations, which acted as asylums, a community mental health centers providing step downs with less in, that were less intensive than hospitals. The most enlightened of the psychiatric services offered strategically planned psychosocial interventions. Within hospitals, this involved the socially corrective uh, milieu type therapy, as was um, illustrated in the movie Girl Interrupted. This slide in shows Alfred Stanton, who with Morris Schwartz was one of the great pioneers in the development of the hospital as something not just as a holding environment where the staff would play an active role in the treatment and their interactions he emphasized with patients made a big difference in whether uh, the hospital experience was positive or not. Um, his co-author Morris Schwartz subsequently became far more famous than Alfred Stanton, though he was director of this hospital, by becoming the, uh, the principal character in Breakfast with Maury. Within outpatient settings, this involves psychotherapy, specifically psychoanalytic psychotherapy. In these therapies, therapists were emotionally neutral, keen observers whose effort were to, was to help patients understand themselves, especially by interpreting what were expected to be their um, uh, in misattributions towards the therapist, what was called tr transference, which is called still transference. Um, psychoanalytic therapies were based on Freud's pioneering theory that behaviors and feelings were governed by unconscious conflicts or motives. In 1895, he wrote about the, what became psychiatry's most famous patient, Anna O., Anna Oppenheimer. Anna O's severe symptoms at the time included hallucinations, intermittent paralysis, sleepwalking, speech problems, and severe anxiety, all of which were each, quotes, restored to normal, quotes, through talk therapy. The remarkable possibility that awareness of unconscious motives could resolve somatic uh, complaints, nightmares, 
hostilities, and psychotic symptoms prompted the adoption of psychoanalysis within psychiatry. This adoption of psychoanalysis by psychiatry subsequently expanded psychiatry's domain from psychoses into less severe forms of psychiatric problems and from hospitals into outpatient settings. In 1968, when I first met Lucille, shock therapy was occasionally used for depression and lithium's value for bipolar disorder was known. But other classes of medications, such as antipsychotics, Thorazine in particular, antidepressants, Elevil in particular, and anxiolytics, Librium in particular, were just then beginning to be used for treatment of uh, psychiatric patients. With such modest therapeutics, why would I choose to become a psychiatrist? It was then, and it still is, by far the most intellectually interesting field of medicine. In 1961, as a young psychiatrist, uh, Robert Coles eloquently celebrated this field's uniquely psychosocial basis and its bridge to humanistic traditions. Psychiatry has links to child development, for example, autism, psychology, for example, issues of self-esteem or phobias, sociology, substance abuse problems, family, um, family um, structures and functioning, forensics, for example, legal accountability, religion, that is, when do faith-based religions, for example, become failures of reality testing, as well as medicine's usual partners of biology and chemistry. It was the area of medicine in which the ability to establish a doctor-patient alliance based on trust and confidentiality was both the most difficult to attain and the most necessary. Moreover, and particularly appealing to my generation, psychiatry held out the hope that its practitioners might claim some precious wisdom, otherwise unavailable, and has some expertise in understanding other humans. These were all intoxicating promises for me and for many others. At the time I came into psychiatry, 10% of the graduating class at Harvard Medical School also did so, and 20% of the graduating class from Yale Medical School. In this talk, I want to outline what occurred within psychiatry during the last 45 years, what it has meant for patients like Lucille and for psychiatrists like me, and then I'll return to whether my immersion in this field has fulfilled my hopes. In 1980, the third edition of the Diagnostic and uh, Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders set forth the first time, for the first time, specific criteria on which to reliably diagnose psychiatric disorders. Because this manual made an official diagnosis of borderline personality disorder on the basis of work I just completed, it also established an identifiable place for me within psychiatry's uh, evolution in the next 40 years. The era of descriptive psychiatry that followed used the so-called Washington School of Psychiatry. Now this is complicated, but it's, I mention it because this was a centerpiece of much of the clinical research which happened over the next 20 years. If a diagnosis was real, it should be, it should be observably distinguished from other disorders. It should have a particular course, so you could say something about the prognosis. It should run in families. It should be your family tree should be populated heavily with other people having the disorder. It should have distinguishable biological markers and it should have treatments which are specific to that disorder and not useful for other disorders. The DSM definition of mental illness is disarmingly clear, yet only a small fraction of those with mental illnesses will be easily identifiable. For, for most people with mental illnesses, the disorders of thinking, behaving, and emotional expression are episodic and only become evident with extended and uh, intimate exposure. Sometimes symptoms of these disorders may even appear to be healthy. A severely depressed uh, patient of mine complained that all her friends kept complimenting her about her weight loss. And it was really a symptom that was most regrettable from her point of view because of the severe depression which caused a loss of appetite. 
the relative inconspicuousness of most mental disorders uh, most of the time lends itself to isolation. Those who have these disorders welcome being inconspicuous, while those who know that their friends or family or others have these disorders feel constrained from talking about it. When the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual established reliable criteria 34 years ago, the field of psychiatric epidemiology began. Uh, it is now estimated that 25% of adults and 20% of children will have had an episode of one form of mental illness or another during the course of the, the past year. And that 50% of the population will have had some form of mental disorder over the course of their lifetime. You look at these uh, figures, or hear those figures, it almost looks like we have a very sick society. Happily or unfortunately, the statistics from other countries are comparable. The prevalence of major psychiatric, uh, uh, the take home message from this is that it's really to increase awareness. Mental illness is not a world apart. These, they are not people who live in another world. Everyone knows many people with these disorders. Many of us, our friends and neighbors, have undiagnosable sub, subsyndromal forms of mental illness uh, that uh, would become evident under adverse life circumstances. The distinctions are not so great, and these disorders are inherently variants of the human condition. Uh, that message, which seems as clear to me now as it did back in 1968, is sometimes very hard to sustain. When Lucille became a patient and I became a psychiatrist, psychopharmacology was in its infancy. During the next 20 years, psychopharmacology research and practice expanded exponentially, became what's frequently referred to as big pharma. Psychopharmacology became a major presence in psychiatry's research portfolio, financial infrastructure, publications, and in our identity. With approval from the FDA in 1981, pharmaceutical companies began direct advertising to consumers. These are sort of riffs on some of the things that you probably have seen the likes of in television and elsewhere, regular magazines. So widespread has psychoactive medication use become that they now constitute four of the top 10 revenue generators within the pharmacology in industry. It's just boggles my mind. Um, that is, we're talking about all classes of medications of all types. Four of the top 10 are psychotropics. They are so widely used. Um, one in five Americans now take psychoactive medicines regularly. Already 10 years ago, 40% of the incoming freshmen at major Ivy League schools were on psychoactive medications. That is at least 50% now. In psychiatry, residency training programs, in, in psych psychiatric residency training programs, the emphasis on psychotherapy and hospital psychiatry, which my generation had received, was gradually replaced by a new emphasis on accurate diagnosis and the wise prescription of our ever-widening range of psychotropic medications. Clinical research testing the validity of diagnoses via biological markers and disorder-specific pharmacotherapies greatly expanded. The departments of psychiatry competed for the greatly expanded research monies from the National Institute of Mental Health, and academic promotions in psychiatry were closely tied to one's success in competing for these monies. Uh, that was something of an eye-opener to me because I had met criteria for a professorial appointment at a relatively early age, but I never got it. And I didn't have a mentor, and uh, nobody told me that uh, I was uh, the standard by which uh, professorial appointments were given had to do with whether I was bringing money in sufficient that I would pay for my salary. Um, an unhappy truth, which... Uh, Eventually, once I got the message, I went to work on research. <laughs>
One could argue that mental health, mental illness became overdiagnosed and psychoactive medications became overused. That would be in aisle six, the worried well section. That is, it is hardly the case that medications are now used only for people with identifiable or diagnosed psychiatric illnesses. They are used very widely for people with, who in this slide are characterized as the worried well. Psychiatry, uh, but the, uh, whether the, the people are overdiagnosed and whether act medications are overused, there's no question that the establishment of clear criteria and the introduction of medications has changed, heightened public awareness enormously, expanded the use and the familiarity with psychiatric diagnoses, and of course, it started what is still an um, expanding market for people who want access to psychoactive meds. Psychiatry was very pleased with this new scientifically valid self. For me, this era passed with some shifts in my identity. Having identified borderline personality disorder, but having failed, I don't mention it here, in a major study to confirm the value of a psychoanalytic therapy for schizophrenia. This, uh, my doubts about the validity of psychoanalysis were certainly uh, well established, and my identity as a clinical researcher was also firmly established. So at this point, I would like to take a break and invite your comments about this early era of psychiatry and my observations about it. Absolutely, I think. <laughs> and I'll come back to that question because it's a very good question. Martin Seligman, who is one of our country's most uh, famous and widely respected psychologists, recently wrote that he does not think the quality of care is any better now than it was when he started about the same time I did. Otto Kernberg was a major figure in psychoanalysis in general, and more specifically within the arena of borderline personality disorder, where in the late 1960s he wrote two seminal papers, one on what was called borderline personality organization, which set the stage for people being familiar with the, uh, that there was something like this. In his system, it was like one third of the universe. There, people either had a borderline personality disorder, a borderline personality organization, a psychotic personality organization, or a neurotic personality organization. What I like about that is, you know, that it isn't as if the normal is set aside from people with psychiatric problems. It's just a matter of how how disordered we are, and uh, that's kind of an appealing concept to me. The problem with the borderline thing was that. It was so broad that it was being applied to a lot of people for whom there was, the, his treatment recommendations would not have been workable at all. He also wrote a paper about a psychoanalytic psychotherapy for borderline patients, which has survived in a much modified <coughs> form to this day. Um, we can talk about that uh, in an, uh, maybe another time. Well, antipsychotics, antidepressants, mood stabilizers, uh, stimulants, uh, those are the major classes. And within each of them, there are different generations of. This is wild proliferation of use of psychoactive medications because people who need them are finally getting something that to help them, or has it gone beyond that into being part of a wider drug culture? where our society has changed its values and use of medications of all sorts has changed radically during these same period of time. I don't have an answer for that, but that's really a fundamental question. Here, we're going back first to Lucille. This, the year now is 2010. How are we doing time-wise? Doing fine. In fact, going a little slow. Well, Lucille, again presents at the age of 23 to the emergency room, accompanied by her still worried boyfriend, 
with complaints of depression, anxiety, suicidality, da 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 da. Same complaints, same patient. This time, her anxiety and depression were perceived to be symptomatic reactions to being alone. It was clear she feared that separation from her boyfriend meant rejection and abandonment. When her story of sexual abuse at age 13 is recounted, a, a fact which, uh, when it was recounted in 1990, led to the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, in 2010, it no longer did that. Um, her parents, who paid for her health insurance, were now um, invited to consult to the treatment uh, despite her prote protests. They and her boyfriend were present when the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder was disclosed. They were told that this disorder involves, they were told that uh, this disorder involves, uh, you know, an excessive preoccupation with the attaining love relationships um, and that it is significantly inherited and that her brain is characterized by abnormally reactive amygdala, under-responsive prefrontal cortex, and excessive neurohormones, and that the natural course of this disorder is that most people will gradually recover. This slide some of you will recognize as something that's derivative of two major longitudinal studies which were started in the 1990s and one of which is still ongoing. Um, uh, the, the first and the longest lasting is by Mary Zanarini here at McLean. The other is a collaborative study which I was proud to head up where McLean was one of four sites. But this is very well established and was eye-opening to all of us including the likes of me who wrote the textbooks about the prognosis before the data came in. Um, very surprising. Uh, indeed, I think the pessimism which has surrounded the prognosis of this diagnosis was because many of us, in the absence of systematic longitudinal assessments of large groups of patients, were only seeing the ones who were the people kept coming back. And we thought, well, the if people don't get better because the ones we kept seeing were only those, which it turns out to be a relative minority, who keep coming back. Um, and that this course, this favorable course, does not depend upon the presence of evidence-based treatments like DBT or other evidence-based treatments. They were told that medications might help, but that Lucille's recovery depends upon her learning to assume control over her behaviors and emotions, um, and that treatments expedite their taking charge of themselves. They are considerably calm, that is, uh, Lucille, her boyfriend, and the parents were considerably calm by this information, and they're given relevant reading materials to take home. Lucille is encouraged to jumpstart her treatment by preparing an autobiographical sketch. Lucille, her boyfriend, and her parents are told that they will need to be active participants in the treatment. Her boyfriend, Bob, however, remains anxious about her suicidality and her going home uh, and the anxieties that which she anticipates around that. He asks whether hospitalization would be safer. He's reassured that self-endangering behaviors are amongst the first symptoms to improve if a treatment is being helpful and that he will, can be helpful in uh, both uh, dim and diminishing the risk of those. Well, this summary summarizes radically different approach to treatment in uh, 2010. Comments or anything on this? So now let's revisit psychopharmacology and diagnosis. Uh, modern psychiatrists routinely reassure their psychotic, depressed, or anxious patients that they have chemical imbalances for which there are effective treatments. Even as they do this, a second generation of research has documented unexpected uh, limitations to this claim. For example, 
It is now unclear whether schizophrenia, schizophrenic patients treated with antipsychotics are significantly better than those given placebos. Remember the $19 billion of profits? Um, it is now clear that psychiatry's most um, common disorder, major depression, only a minority, about 38%, will respond to antidepressants. Um, and that the augmentation strategies, which are usually used for what becomes then treatment-resistant depressions, may at their best add another 15%, so that at best you might have 50% of people with major depressions who have remissions on account of antidepressants. Similarly, though mood stabilizers significantly help about two-thirds of patients with bipolar disorder, sustained remissions, even in those who are well treated with mood stabilizers, occur in only 10%. While the remarkable and cost-effective benefits for patients who do respond cannot be underestimated, that is, tremendous advances have been made in the treatment of these disorders on account of the uh, introduction of psychoactive medications, these results are considerably less than most psychiatrists believe and far less than what patients in the public have been led to expect. Uh, in fact, the, the picture is considerably worse than what I, this slide shows what I just said, because 70% of the medications which are prescribed are not done by psychiatrists, and they are done for patients who do not meet criteria for the disorders for which they're being treated, and there is uh, inadequate doses and poor follow-up. Moreover, when you look at the psychosocial functioning of even those patients in this class of schizophrenia and depression and borderline personality disorder, I would say, who have good responses to medications, they do not have satisfactory and good lives. It may be addressing the symptoms, but it is not helping them have good lives. Another reason uh, of note is the research that shows psychotherapies have similar or better effects than medications, and then almost universally, when the two are combined, the results are better than either one alone. I was attended a, I was on a symposium uh, this last May, where this fellow was talking about how, with respect to antidepressants, psychotherapies affect more people. So you get 38 percent, let's say, with medications, you might have like 45 percent who will respond. A broader range of good response, and that it lasts longer. The results last longer, so the relapses are less long. So he said, I think we should revise the standards for treatment of depression to include psychotherapy as an adjunct. Well, that's just how warped our psychiatry's thinking has become. The, you know, what he said is that psychotherapy should be given as the first line of treatment and medications while they are much more cost beneficial, uh, are going to affect a smaller portion for less time. So that, you know, the... Okay, another reason for psychopharmacology's declining status is a quiet scandal involved what's been cryptically called Pharmageddon. <laughs> Laugh. <you> know, <laughs> Uh, um, the danger of big pharma's correct, corrupting impact on medicine in general, and psychiatry in particular, became public about 10 years ago. This was initiated by a senator from, I think it's Iowa or Nebraska, but I, I have not traced it down very much. But did a Senate, there was a major investigation into this. Um, Pharma-sponsored studies with negative outcomes were not published. Our trial showed that the new drug performed doing better than placebo. Hmm, we should invest in placebos. <laughs> um, many doctors were receiving generous payments for endorsing medications or receiving academic credits for articles ghostwritten by pharma companies. Pharma monies were fine funding grand round speakers 
paying faculty salaries, and giving seductive perks to doctors who attended industry-sponsored symposia. There was a Glo Globe Spotlight article some years ago identifying a few of our well-known local psychiatrists who were making, um, uh, let's say, four to six times more money than a usual psychiatrist. We are amongst the uh, least reimbursed of the me medical professions, but there was hope all of a sudden that we might join the rich. Uh, and this was part of a scandal about how pharmaceutical monies had infiltrated the uh, academic system. The prominent chairman of several departments of psychiatry who were receiving very large consulting fees were quietly asked to step down. Accompanying this decline in psychopharmacology's claim is the growing recognition of the limitations in our diagnostic system, a much acclaimed diagnostic system. I should say that the uh, United States, psychiatry in this country really uh, sets the stage for the rest of the world. Um, when we make diagnostic changes, they're almost always everybody else adopts them. Even though there's an international classification of disease, they use our system. The, much of the advances in psychiatric treatment and much of the research done about the origins of the disorder based in this country. That's changing now for complex reasons. But uh, anyway, the limitations in our classification system have now been uh, underlined. Using that Washington School of Psychiatry's standards for validating psychiatric disorders, um, validation uh, turned out to be slippery for most disorders. There is too much overlap between categories. For example, something so basic as the separation of anxiety disorders and depressive disorders turns out not to be easy at all. Most depressed people are anxious, most anxious people are depressed. There are still no biological markers for any disorder, despite the huge amount of money that has been spent on the neurobiology of psychiatric illnesses. And the specificity of treatments has never been convincing. For those of you who are here because of your familiarity with borderline personality disorder, the newest uh, issue or newest edition of the Manual for Dialectical Behavior Therapy now has a section for the application to eating disorders, the application to substance abuse disorders, the application to antisocial personality disorder. It is a wonderful treatment for borderline personality disorder. It also is very useful for other things. And so it has been with something like antipsychotics. It's only a modest proportion of people who receive antipsychotic medicines are psychotic. There's just not much link or close link between the treatments and the disorders, and the disorders' boundaries are so inherently fu fuzzy that they overlap quite enormously. Um, Alan Francis, the uh, head of the, four of the fourth edition of the DSM, has uh, charged that our diagnoses have become so diffuse that we are eliminating normal and that big pharma money has underwritten this expansion. It's very, very important from a psychopharmacological industry's point of view, and this is not their fault, this is psychiatry's fault, but it's very valuable from their point of view to have a very broad net that, uh, and nowhere is this more evident than in the diagnosis of bipolar disorder in children. That diagnosis is often given not for people who meet criteria, and it's 10 times more frequent in Boston than it is, say, in Iowa. Uh, and it is pushed very much by the psychopharmacological interests. Uh, they'd like to see their mood stabilizers given. It shouldn't be narrowed. They may be right in part, but don't underestimate how the expansion of diagnoses can be um, uh, generated by the eagerness to treat somebody with medications. These problems with the expansion of psychiatric diagnoses and their lack of specificity were behind the efforts to change psychiatric diagnoses 
from categories, that is discrete entities, to dimensions, that is people have more or less of a particular disorder, when the recently published fifth edition of the DSM was undertaken. And it's behind the National Institute of Mental Health's refusal to fund research based on the DSM classification. Quite extraordinary. These efforts to revise the classification uh, have led to highly charged debates in which the value of known clinical traditions and knowledge are weighed against still unproven but conceptually credible hypotheses about how the carb nature at the joints. And uh, the majority of it is done by primary care physicians, uh, nurses also. Um, and uh, they're given for things like insomnia or anxiety, um, uh, not because of delusions and hallucinations. I'm always not going to get to it, but of course it's a very vivid story in which there was, um, I'll, I'll give you a brief. The committee for reviewing and proposing changes in the personality disorder section um, wanted to change the system radically and to move away from categories. And they argued that most of the personality types like dependent or obsessive compulsive or avoidant is something that is more or less present and there's not a lot of research done on it, and there's not, no specificity of treatment. So why not put the classification of personality into a system which is more akin to the structure of normal personality, where the normal personality is composed of basically five factors. The worried, anxious, the unhappy people, the highly expressive people, uh, the people who are open to new experiences, uh, people who are very compulsive and organized and uh, conscientious. So that the world across all cultures, those personality prototypes, factors uh, are present. They wanted to move the system in that direction. Unfortunately, borderline personality disorder was caught in that crossfire because borderline personality disorder, unlike any other personality disorder, has met the criteria for that uh, validation as well or better than most of the other categories. Uh, it has specific treatments with a known prognosis and the neurobiology is nicely outlined and so forth. So it is more like a robust category than most others. So there was a tension largely generated by people like myself who wanted to retain the value of that and not throw that out with the bathwater. I don't mind dimensionalizing others, but it did. So there was a struggle that went down to the last minute. The external review committee said the proposed changes were too radical and not scientifically based. They said that the proposed changes were not clinically useful. So unfortunately, what that means is that there's been no change in the personality disorders. But the crux of the issue was always borderline personality disorder. So it's, it's unchanged, not even an iota, except that it can now be applied to adolescents. For better or for worse, I wrote an alternative proposal about the way I thought it should be changed wasn't that I was opposed to change. I think there's a lot of reason to change it in some ways. But uh, you know, they tried to move it in that direction, the committee did. The committee was deeply divided. Uh, it was loaded with academic psychologists who really had no patience or interest in the clinical psychiatry. They didn't treat patients and weren't interested in that. What they wanted is a classification system that reflected the architecture of personality. And then there were some clinicians it's who's coffee. I wrote, I've written about it. It's a, it's a good talk, actually, if you invite me back. <laughs> but it really went right down to the last minute. I was asked to come down to testify to the uh, trustees. Um, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> All right. 
the widely esteemed outgoing president of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, there's a section now that has to do with all the new research on etiology and the genetics and what it has shown us and what it hasn't shown us. I would say on a one sentence or two sentence summary is that the genetic research, which was so promising when the genome was unveiled in 2003, has revealed that there's no discrete cluster of genes which are associated with any of the disorders and that, that um, uh, whether genes become manifest or not depends on the environment. It isn't like you can look at the genome and tell what's going to happen to a person. A lot of us had sort of simplistic predetermination ideas. You got this gene, then you'll get schizophrenia. Well, even with schizophrenia, you get these genes, and whether you get schizophrenia or not depends on the environment. So that's called epigenetics. Whether genes become manifest depend on the environment. So we're back into something which is much more rich, much more interesting, much more complicated. After all the effort to whitewash the contributions of families to the development of psychiatric illnesses, we have to go back and say, how do they help or how do they hinder the development of a disorder? They're active players. They're usually not intentionally, there's rarely ever any malevolence within a family, but some families are better, more poorly suited for a kid with this disposition than they are for a kid with another disease. That's another subject. I want to go back to my overview comments here. I've got only a few minutes. So I'm going to actually stop that and say um, something personal. The public's perception of psychiatry and its confidence in us is not high. We sometimes refer to ourselves as shrinks. A friend announces my arrival on the practice tee by saying quack, quack. <laughs> we are frequently featured in cartoons, television serials, and movies. Being, being a psychiatrist invites humor and wariness. It can set you apart. Upon learning I'm a psychiatrist, people say things like, that's scary. <clears throat> or so what do you actually do? <laughs> Or, uh, are you reading my mind? <laughs> Someone on a plane unapologetically declared, this must mean you've got your own personal problems. In 2011, Marshall Middlinehan, who pioneered the uh, DBT treatment for borderline personality disorder, reluctantly revealed that she had spent two years of her adolescence on the uh, inpatient unit at the Hartford Institute of Living. She did this to destigmatize borderline personality disorder, and because her friends had so often asked about, her, her patients had so often asked about her scarred forearms. Personal problems aren't necessary to work in this field. Indeed, a balanced, healthy life is a better asset. What's necessary is compassion for those who do have these problems. Personal problems can sometimes inspire, but more often, they will handicap those who will want to serve the mentally ill. Mental illness, though, is not a world apart, nor are psychiatrists. Under adverse circumstance, life circumstances, we are all vulnerable. I think I'll end with that note. So, other comments. I'll end with Lucia. <laughs> In 2014, when I last saw Lucille, she had become much more stable over the now five years of her treatment. Now 28, she remained an anxious and sensitive person, but she was no longer suicidal or depressed, and she no longer had episodes of paranoia or dissociation. She had finally married her boyfriend, Bob, a year ago, and since then her visits to me, what she calls refueling, have become increasingly infrequent. She and Bob were now in the process of relocating. In the course of our meeting, I wondered when I would see her next. She burst into tears saying, I really can't deal with the idea of not seeing you. My eyes also filled up and I said, still, you might like me to help you find someone closer to where you live. It was the right question, but I didn't really want to do it. Uh, she softly protested, no, I don't think I need to see anyone now. I expect to be coming back here. I knew that that would not be easy and was less likely than she imagined. When I do need to see someone, she said, I will certainly ask for your help. 
We then reviewed highlights of our work together, how she had learned to identify and cope with her fears of being alone, how she had remembered, re-experienced, and recovered from trauma, how she'd become forgiving of and forthright with her parents. When the time was up, we stood up, we looked at each other, and I said, I would like to give you a hug, uh, except that that would feel too much like saying goodbye. She looked sad, and she said, I know. And then we hugged, and that was the end. All, class, all. all classifications help some, none help dramatically. I would say that it's arbitrary, but I would say about 20 to 30 percent of people with borderline personality disorder have some significant response to medications. Uh, it's not, it's, it, it, it makes them, uh, it makes, it facilitates their working on themselves. And, uh, but unless they work on changing themselves, it doesn't, you know, by itself and won't do much. Thank you. Well, I think that, that I, a young colleague of mine from Australia was, we are talking uh, about early interventions, and he says, you know, this isn't rocket science. And that's what I believe absolutely. The problems, the, the obstacles to treating borderline patients are oftentimes within the treaters. It's not like this is work that anybody and everybody can do and certainly would want to do. But most people can do good enough. And the patients are handicapped by a bad press. Uh, the handed down wisdom still in most places is that these are people who are untreatable and or that they're gonna you know, get sued or they're gonna kill themselves and you'll have a lawsuit, I mean a lawsuit and uh, that you'll be up all night uh, because of phone calls and that um, they're tr treatment resisting, help rejecting complainers. And that um, myth persists. That those are problems which you can encounter. They're usually not very, very last very long. And it, clinicians who have their feet on the ground, good sense, and sort of lean forward when somebody gets angry at them instead of uh, getting taking it personally, like they, I shouldn't be treated this way. You know, they they're in for one of the more rewarding things you can do in life. I think. So I'm going to go home now. <laughs>